we are all coming together and that's great to know and the warmth and the camaraderie is quite palpable in the way we have been greeting each other that's really wonderful yeah it will help if we can uh, you know put off the uh, mute the microphone so that everybody can hear thank you very much uh, you know i i'm reminded of a uh, couple of decades back uh, we've been talking about the wuka world since then you know and uh, last year is the only year when the wuka world has manifested in all its element across all geographies across all strata of the societies and across all economies right and that's given us a lot of learning having said that uh, maybe around the same time two decades back the institute of the future attached to the university of phoenix did a study about how the future of work will emerge in the coming decades right and they talked about extreme longevity they talked about the computational world they talked about the globally connected world super structured organization so on and so forth and they also talked about some very relevant key skills right like uh, you know cross cultural competency social intelligence and things like that so true that has become right today we are competing for the future and that's the context in which i'm really delighted to invite uh, professor steve white managing partner corporate rebirth and professor of strategy and leadership university of bath school of management uk like atul mentioned steve is also the author of management and leadership in the fourth industrial revolution his book was released in the year 2020 which is last year in the midst of the pandemic and all of that right he released this book in november in this book after studying over 50 global organizations he presents a framework and deals with leadership and organization capabilities to achieve superior performance as we navigate through the fourth industrial revolution well let's hear from him how we as a group as leaders can leverage humanity in leadership and then deliberate what it means to leadership leadership in organization in this era right uh, see welcome uh, and thank you very much once again uh, i'd like to set set the conversation going by asking you the first question you did this extensive research and uh, you talked about the emerging fourth industrial revolution would you share with us some insights around the various dimensions you talked about six dimensions and the three axioms and so on and so forth so can you talk to us about what 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 is your research all about and what is it that we have to learn from this research especially the dimension significance of individual and collective leadership sure um let me answer that i put up a couple of slides i've got a couple of pages here i'm not going to do a whole presentation but um to answer that question sometimes a visual might help a little bit all right so let me uh just do this he said trying to take over uh okay or maybe i can't maybe i'm not allowed to i don't think i've been given permission to share so i won't do that so um let me say so the answer to to your first question is i was looking i started off asking the question what makes com some companies perform much better than others in highly dynamic environments and uh probably going to inject i think you should be able to share it now if if you oh, okay he said i think for instance oh yes wonders of technology bear with me a second i'm going to have to uh, momentarily share the wrong screen and then get it over to you That looks good too, actually. <laughs> yeah, we got. Can you see it? He said, "Yeah, I guess you can, because I can see myself." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the question I started off with, and um, I just wanted to sort of anchor what I'm going to say in this context, uh, because your top. Actually, I'm really excited about your topic. I mean, I love this idea of um, uh, leadership and humanity. So. Uh, it really resonates with me. Um, it's not a lens that I was using um, previously, and uh, so it's a delight to to be on this call and share my thoughts. So, but I wanted to kind of share my perspectives from where the research I was doing and the work I was doing with companies. Uh, there's, I think, there's a huge, there's a quite a significant overlap. Um, but uh, obviously, I'm not specifically talking to to uh, leadership with humanity. So I was looking really at what makes companies uh, thrive, essentially, uh, in this environment. 
uh, of uh, highly dynamic situations. And, uh, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of companies and individuals out there who produce laundry lists of uh, things and say, these are all the factors of leadership that matter and so forth. Um, but there are very few that have actually connected that to company performance um, in, a, in a meaningful way or uh, have actually looked at the interrelationship between those different factors. So it becomes more than just a laundry list. So that's the gap that I wanted to, to address really. And um, uh, I tracked the co uh, companies, um, including Mondelez, thankfully, to at all. Um, on this scale that after the, the, of over five years and see how they performed. And, and the answer is, if you do these various things, uh, then you, over, you outperform your own peers. So over a five year period, those that were doing well on the index of, of these factors that were researched, uh, their share price outperformed their own peers for their own markets. And similarly, those uh, who were weaker on the index, i.e. they weren't very strong with those capabilities, underperformed their own peers. And that's quite a significant difference. So that really gave, us the, gave me the legitimacy to say, this is the A formula for thriving in the fourth industrial revolution, which is a highly dynamic environment. Now, to Kenneth's amazingly timed point, which I didn't prime him with when he was saying about last year being the perfect storm, um, so uh, although my official research kind of looks at these companies until uh, the end of 2019, 2020 was quite interesting. So I've looked at the share price there and it's actually what happened in 2020, because it's a, this massive period of disturbance and dynamic environment, the difference is really pronounced, even more pronounced than it was uh, over the initial five years. So, Again, I think there's uh, some, some sort of background and this sort of supports where, we go, where, where I'm trying to say. So what I want to say is um, what came out, the, the, there is these dimensions. These are a little bit provocative, but things that are different in modern times. I, I keep using the word fourth industrial revolution, 4IR. Um, fourth industrial revolution is already here. It doesn't happen overnight, everywhere simultaneously. Uh, but leading companies or companies are adapting to that environment and step changes like a pandemic and we'll react to that just accelerate those changes. So there are six things that came out which are very different, a little bit provocative, but uh, hopefully some food for conversation later on. And I'll answer this one and then I'll do the, the three that I kind of mentioned before and then I'll pause. Um, but the six, just to get us thinking, are uh, there is a difference of what's the critical scarce resource. Now, when we when I was growing up and going to my first 20 years as a strategy consultant, we were looking at finance, the availability of cash, the, work, uh, the weighted average cost of capital, IRRs, NPVs on projects, uh, capital efficiency of companies, return on capital employed, lots and lots of metrics like that which were important. And for the last 12 years, we've had quantitative easing. Basically governments around the world printing money and giving it away for free. And, uh, and so now, actually, what we've come to realize is that cash is not the really shortage, it's talent. For our talent, talent can operate in this environment. So right from the get-go, it's not the finances matter, of course, we need money, but we now need to put a focus on the scarcest resource talent. And I think that talks directly to this point of uh, leadership with humanity, and we can expand on that going forward. Uh, management approach, you know, in the world of uh, when finance dominated and so forth was about avoiding risk and optimizing processes, looking for efficiencies, eking out things. And very clearly now there's a premium on speed. So uh, if you take the extreme example of that, that would be um, like SpaceX versus NASA, right? NASA's approach to sending rockets up was thousands and thousands of calculations and testing and thinking things very carefully and so forth. And uh, the SpaceX approach is, well, we're gonna assemble the next three and on the center because the first one's gonna blow up anyway, let's not worry about it, but we'll learn from that. And so speed, speed is the, the approach which, which matters uh, much more than optimization. And then stakeholder management, we used to think about uh, purely direct. So originally people gave us money, shareholders, then employee, well, uh, customers was the next phase in the eighties and nineties, uh, customer centric organization and employees, employee engagement, all super important. But increasingly, we're also having to think about indirect stakeholders, and that's outside of our control. So, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> and Sky News just interrupted. Um, so the, the indirect is very important. I mean, this tells us all about leaders' humanity. What's our, uh, what's our brand as a leader? How are we known beyond the people we just talked to? So uh, we've got to be out there standing for something um, and 
And that, that brand of who we are carries forward in the big organization. Data, you know, backward looking to forward looking, uh, leadership and organization, very much from a command and control, the resource we've got to a connect and collaborate connecting outside of our organization, collaborating. And again, there's lots of uh, issues of leadership and humanity coming in, in that part, I think, because why do people want to collaborate? How effective are you at reaching across borders, boundaries of your organization or borders uh, geographically? And then di digital as well as changing to, to sort of application sharing and so forth. So those are the kind of six paradigms. I'm happy to drill into any of those uh, that you like. And then the other part of uh, Kanna's question was essentially the structure of the book, which is, um, the three axioms, uh, which are these three, and uh, to give you a bit more flavor of what they are, and uh, to show you, the build dynamic capacity is this ability of an organization to be adaptable, agile, if you like, and it has these three elements to it, the ability to sense and make sense. So that requires a mindset of curiosity, of being open-minded. One could argue that's, uh, that's a very strong leadership trait, but maybe has connections to humanity. Um, the second one is uh, driving audacious growth. That's the speed part coming through there. Um, and what we've realized is that needs to be purpose-led, uh, to be authentic or meaningful and sustainable. And so how does that come into play? And I think there's lots of aspects of uh, leadership of humanity in there, to, particularly in a uh, purpose-led part, which is pursuing a societal purpose. And then the third uh, axiom, the third truth is this idea of uh, winning the race of 4 IR talent. As I said, talent is the shortest, uh, the scarcest commodity right now for this environment. So that's what three elements, develop, deploy, and retain effectively. And retain has this large part about the duty of care. So when I was thinking about this call and where you, know, you guys might want to take the conversation, uh, I thought, you know, where does leadership with humanity fit in? And kind of, I got at least these six out of my nine, where I think it's relevant, um, but I probably would argue it's relevant in all nine areas, to be honest with you. I don't know, Ken, that's a very long answer, but I hope that was giving some structure to you. No, very, very relevant. Thank you very much. And it's kind of sets the context very well. Uh, before I, before I uh, take this forward, I would request all participants to use the chat box and put in your questions. As we are having this conversation, Atul is looking into the chat box and and we'll definitely bring up your questions as we go along, right? So uh, feel free to uh, make it more conversational. I'll, I'll ask the next question and then possibly I'll pause if there are any questions from the audience so that we can take up for discussion, right? Uh, Steve, uh, you know, I see the importance of the three axioms that you're talking about and how, uh, you know, well it fits into the current context of the VUCA world, the agility and the speed with which we need to respond to what's happening around us, right? Very, yeah. very clear. And at the same time, uh, every single organization is asking for audacious growth. There's no doubt about it. That's the only way they can survive. But where I'm finding a little bit of a challenge and I need some, I need some more clarity from you. How does the purpose agenda and the audacious growth agenda come together? Right? And if you can throw some light and some understanding that you have from the research that you've already done, it will help us to take that forward. Yeah. Sure, sure. So um, the issue about purpose is that uh, it needs to be catalytic for a lot of people to come through. So what we're finding is that the idea of a purpose which is meaningful for the leadership team but also the organization also stakeholders direct and indirect stakeholders uh, tends to be settling on a purpose which is uh, societal and significant and so the the frame that um oh, actually you can see that can you um we sort of think about is these three uh circles in the top left. <laughs> uh, so there's a big societal need. And then there's uh, some unique capabilities within your organization, within the organization. And then you just simply have to be passionate about it. You know, what do we really care about? Now, if you get those three uh, elements together, then uh, you can uh, get quite, you can get a lot of momentum from as I said, direct, immediate reports, suppliers, customers, and so forth, but also the indirect, the, the folks who give you, as they say, the social license to operate. And, and so this uh, purpose part is also um, incredibly linked. I mean, so there's a very strong correlation, there's a 45% correlation to, uh, to company performance for, for firms which adopt a strong purpose. 
particularly they are uh, able to get ahead during times of uh, disturbance. So like the last year, the book year, uh, of, sorry, the book, book environment or the pandemic year, you know, my words mixed up. To give you an example, I mean, so here I've got a few brands that, you know, I've, I've worked with recently. Um, John Lewis, for those of you who don't know, is a large retailer, does department stores in the UK and uh, also supermarkets. And uh, supermarkets might be doing quite well right now, uh, but now having physical visits, at least in the UK, uh, department stores have been sort of in decline for a long period of time because Amazon, amongst others, and online shopping. And, uh, but John Lewis has uh, sort of really leaned into uh, their purpose, what's their purpose mission. And uh, although, of course, like everybody in the sector, they're suffering, um, they, uh, the various uh, commentators, uh, including on Sky News, who just interrupted me, um, in the last two weeks have been saying that because of their purpose led and how they're acting through this pandemic to promote purpose first, that they are probably going to be the last department store still standing in, in uh, after the pandemic, and uh, I just I think I've got it here. I've got some. Uh... Oh, no, no, my, sorry, no, sorry, 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 oh, sorry. I will get there. One second. Uh, here. My new click on. Yeah. So I've got their uh, statement, which is um, it's the happiness of their members. So they are. A, every person who works in the company is a member. Uh, they have the membership model, and they've decided to really promote this, uh, this sense, the, the, the well-being and the happiness uh, of their members. And they just really emphasize that, and so that's that's giving them resilience uh, to see themselves through this pandemic and this in this downturn in their sector. Of course, they're going to close a few stores and so forth, but uh, it's massive. So that's a very live example of of a client situation. But the idea of purpose is that. Uh, you're focusing on something that's not just the short, well, not just the bottom line and the pursuit of purpose. If you make really clear, big, audacious goals to pursue that purpose, that gives you momentum and impetus and that drives, that drives growth. Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry. Well, that, so it's always difficult. I'm not sure whether I can, so I can't really see you. So I don't know if like you're itching to ask the next question. But, uh, apologize. Uh, can it's if I may... getting a lot of thought in our minds and, you know, uh, sorry, Atul. I was. No, I, I, was I just got I, curious I was with the... the last decade or so when I was working with PepsiCo, where we had the performance with purpose drive, and you know all that you said. I'm remembering that where we where we were working towards balancing both the business results and the people. Yeah, Atul, go ahead. Thanks, Karen. Sorry. So, you know, this conversation, Steve, on purpose, and all of us who've been in the corporate long enough talk about, I mean, this is a very active conversations, uh, conversation in the organizations. But uh, I think the key difference is how to make a business case for purpose. Because purpose, uh, there is always this kind of tension, Steve, between uh, you know, getting the organizations to uh, sustained but short-term success versus purpose, which is predominantly long-term driven. And there's, there's a conversation or a dialogue around getting purpose embedded. But I think there is, as long as we are not able to build a strong business case, which I see you talking about, where the organizations see that this will help them to be more successful, both in the short-term and, and the near-term this becomes a nice conversation. You know, people like us who work in uh, people function will keep driving for it, but it doesn't get embedded in the business strategy. So I, I don't know if you have a perspective which will help, especially last year's data points, as you called out, help organizations to see a real business case in, in purpose. Yeah, so, well, I, so I think the concept separate from strategy where the problem is. We need to move the pursuit of purpose to be the strategy so that they are embedded. And then there is not a conflict between the pursuit of strategy, uh, financial returns and so forth, and the achievement of the purpose. So uh, obviously I just you, you gave you the example of uh, John Lewis, but. Um, you know, I've also gone on the screen there. You know, Unilever, Unilever is a fact. Um, you know, a, a story that's been around a long time. Um, well, 2009, I guess. Um, and 
when they decided to adopt the uh, sustainability agenda and uh, included in the audacious goals that they set for themselves was uh, doubling the size of the business whilst halving the uh, environmental impact. And uh, so they, uh, they, they, they embraced purpose right at the level of the strategy. And it then uh, was not only what they did to feel good in, internally, but also influenced their choice of products in the portfolio, how they interacted with the supply chain and, and so on and so forth. And the story is, is, is famous. Um, it's not a short term thing in their case, but uh, I mean, Paul Pullman followed that for the 10 years of his tenure. Um, but uh, there was annual reporting of, uh, of goals and progress being achieved against purpose. So um, I, th I think the three intersecting circles that I've got on this page is where the conversation needs to be. And so that needs to be um, getting to a purpose which the company can embrace, the leadership can embrace, which becomes the strategy. And uh, another example of uh, a firm I did a little work with is Syngenta. It's an agrochemicals company. And yes, that is chemicals that you put on agriculture. Um, and uh, they, uh, the way the company is formed, so the, most of the leaders had grown well through the company and got extremely wealthy and got to this point uh, about again, about 10 years ago, when uh, some of the leaders were reflecting to me and saying, well, you know, we're, we've made millions uh, through share in, uh, value increase and so forth. Why do we get out of bed in the morning? You know, what's the purpose now? What are we going to do? And so they went on what they could describe as a purpose safari. Um, it took them 18 months and they brought in lots of different speakers. They went and visited different places around the world. And then they looked through these lenses and they said, well, there are unique capabilities, well, agriculture and chemistry and so forth. And um, what are the big issues that we could work, uh, work towards supporting? And um, so they looked a lot at uh, water efficiency in agriculture, which is a big uh, global crisis looming about water. Um, they looked at, uh, therefore, uh, productivity per acre that come out of uh, um, the, the, the land or the crops. And, and they looked at getting more wealth into how they could support the income and well-being of smaller farmers rather than big industrial farmers. So they took on board some uh, of these uh, particular aspects, which they had unique capabilities for, not at the detriment at all of um, profitability, <clears throat> but it gave them a new uh, impetus for not only the success of the firm, the leaders to get out of bed, uh, but also to, to embrace a bigger ecosystem of partnerships that uh, would, would come together for that, rather, for that pursuit of that purpose, rather than um, uh, just seeing it as uh, supporting a company. So they, they were instrumental in the formation of this thing called the Agriculture Gateway, which is partnerships with folks like uh, John Deere and so forth. Uh, so equipment um, uh, companies as well as their own products and then uh, IT companies to help them to make sure they were getting uh, pursued as an e ecosystem of these, uh, these goals. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think the, the answer to the question is, is if purposes seem to be separate to strategy, then it's probably not going to be a uh, sustained uh, pursuit and it's not going to move the needle of performance. That's great. Karan, there are some great questions in the dialogue box. So do you want me to read or you can read those? Yeah, I can I can read them and and you know some of these questions are very, very relevant and segues into what you want to discuss more. Right. One of the questions that Mahalakshmi has asked is uh, as we see the fluid workforce becoming more and more normal, how would some of these constructs of care and duty of care that you talked about, right? Uh, and alignment with organizational purpose play out given the fluidity around, you know, that we are going through and basis what aligns to their own purpose and dreams, right? So how do we bring that care element and the uh, organizational purpose element, bring them all together in the, in the context of the current situation of fluidity? Okay. Um, well, so I mean, I'm going to try and ask that question uh, in a couple of different ways. So I think there's fluidity in terms of who's, who is my workforce. <clears throat> so is it like the gig economy type stuff, right? And you've yeah. got 
flexibility of working in terms of work-life balance and where you work, work from home, work from anywhere kind of uh, stuff, right? So I'm not sure which of those two you want to go down. Um, <clears throat> the research that I did says we've got to have the duty of care for all workers, whether they are regarded as staff or contract. There is an, uh, a, a benefit to the performance of the company if we have a reputation as a good employer however you want to define the contract terms within. And companies that um, are um, sharp with their definition of who's an employer and who, who's an employee and who's not, and differentiate as to how they care for those individuals, um, end up suffering in the talent they can uh, retain or rely upon. So uh, the very clearly from the work is this idea that the duty of care needs to send it to all workers. That's why I use the word workers rather than employees. We're going to get into some legalist thing. Um, there are three aspects that came up particularly. Uh, skilling, upskilling, reskilling, helping people learn, adapt, evolve. So whether they're employees or not, um, that's a benefit. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of online available libraries of content that companies can uh, have assembled or have access to, making sure that uh, that's available to everybody and encourage people to, to improve uh, is, is critical. Uh, having uh, watch outs and support for well-being, support resilience. There's an, the CIPD calls it the epidemic of stress, which is going on, or the World Health Organization says that as well. Epidemic of stress, you know, ha everybody's su suffering. So uh, the research I did in, since coming to the UK which some of you know is not that long ago, only a couple of years ago. Uh, had, I, I worked with a large telco uh, here, uh, looking at, in fact, the lower levels in the organization, rather than, you know, I usually talk to sort of managers and, and leaders and stuff. <clears throat> and it was really quite fascinating because there's an issue, you know, I'll just, I'll just open up all the slides here. Um, uh, there's an issue uh, that came through about, um, <clears throat> Basically, uh, do you, do people are people allowed at the lower levels to um, take personal calls or use their mobile devices for personal activities during the workday? And actually, that's a huge issue of trigger stress point for a lot of people. And there are a couple of reasons why that plays out. So, so you need to think carefully about policies like that of. Uh, of mobile device usage or data uh, that's allowed it. And so, for example, if someone's got young children, uh, if they want to know if they're sick or grandparents have not picked the children up from school or whatever happens to be, so that they can intervene. And if they're not allowed to be making personal calls and so forth during the day, that can be a problem, a cause of stress. Similarly, they've got elderly parents, similarly, if you know, someone's sick around them or whatever. So uh, having access and ability to do personal things can be really important. Um, I, w one of the uh, groups, the, actually an alcohol company I worked with in the UK uh, last year, uh, beginning of last year, first quarter, um, was uh, looking at del delivery drivers. And what was interesting uh, was that they were saying that uh, they wanted to have total control of these individuals and so forth. But they, when I actually ride with these people and talk to them, they are actually doing two jobs. So they, in order to make enough money, essentially they are doing night jobs. Uh, <laughs> not everybody, of course, but you know, for you know, one guy was, uh, was doing uh, other deliveries for a supermarket chain at night on the night shift. Uh, another person was doing uh, 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 gig economy type stuff with the house viewings. Uh, and they, in order to get the gig economy jobs or to know what their roster is for the nice and so forth, they need to be monitoring their devices the whole time. So uh, if, if they, and they're under a lot of stress, they will prefer to be working one job, but effectively they need to work too. So one can argue they should be paid more, but uh, the other part is don't prevent them from also, or don't prevent individuals from managing other responsibilities, be their children or be their income based or where they have to be uh, around. So you need to get, provide that flexibility. So, uh, so this idea of duty of care is very important at the level of not command and control, uh, is connect and collaborate. And most importantly, having uh, empathy for, um, for everybody, everybody who's in the organization, who's operating around the, whose contribution you need. Um, so 
so this idea of duty of care is really, really important. And um, as I said, kind of workplace flexibility is part of it. Uh, a, a piece of work that I didn't initiate, but I finished up when I, when I arrived over here at the university is around uh, mobile, the work-life balance and mobile device uh, management. And uh, the, the goal of the work when it was commissioned was what's the formula uh, for companies? And, uh, and the, there's some legislation come through in France uh, and Germany about the right to switch off. So uh, employees don't have to have their devices on at home and so forth. Anyway, so when, when, you, when you look at the, the research though, and you actually start talking to people, uh, you can't have a one size fits all policy and because some people are really stressed if they can't be checking their emails at home. Right? They wanna feel connected all the time. Uh, they think it's part of their job and they've got colleagues in different parts of the world in different time zones. And to tell them they are not allowed to by because you're trying to manage their stress level actually increases their stress level and you've got others of course who who want to really switch off so so you've got to have uh policies in place which allow personal choice and flexibility and uh that's where the validation part comes on this this chart which is you've got to show that that range of behaviors is possible and appropriate and so that's where uh, supervisors need to be supportive of uh, of and, and, and role modeling uh, those behavior ranges that are appropriate. Uh, you need to be providing explicit uh, rules and guidance so people know how what the boundaries are within, within which they can choose, um, but it needs to give them space for flexibility. And of course you need to give them feedback and support. So um, I don't know. So in terms of flexibility uh, question, I hope that gives a flavor for it. It's the duty of carriers to everybody and whether they're employees on, or gig workers, uh, you need to be investing in them. And you really need to be thinking about the triggers and causes of stress for, for individuals. Some, some very, very, very simple recommendations that you have here. And I'm sure, you know, some, uh, I'm, all, of the, all of these, you know, if you can at least implement some of them, I think it will build a sense of belongingness in the workplace. And, that's, that's a very, very important aspect we must keep in mind. And also related to this, there's a comment from Eva who talks about how happiness is at work is very critical for the success of business. And, and that's, a great, that's a great point she's brought about, right? I'm going to look at the other question uh, from James. James is talking about the book around, uh, the book Good to Great, right? Where it talks about level five leadership. And uh, the question James has is what new did you learn in researching your book and what new aspects of leadership are critical to business success? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> the, in terms of what, I think, I think there's a what and there's a how part, right? So the mindsets that uh, underpin these nine boxes, I think are really, um, uh, telling and expanding. Things. I got, have I got them? So let's see if I got them somewhere. Maybe here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got um, all these mindsets, and uh, these are in. They all. I mean, you can't have every mindset. Otherwise, you're probably going freaking out. But uh, I think for an individual leader, they've got to work out where their um, what they need to amplify most to have most impact in their business as it is, right? And uh, the three axioms are, are universal um, to all organizations, but uh, how strongly you play them is going to depend on your strategy. So let me distill that into English. <laughs> so uh, one of the companies in the research, uh, the original set of research I did was is a semiconductor manufacturer and uh, a market that they are op were operating in is uh, semiconductors for mobile phones. And the mobile phone market is moving incredibly quickly. And this company has a, an okay market share, but uh, is really kind of strong, has been really struggling to make enough money basically in that sector. And when we use this frame, it was clear that what they needed to have was much higher axiom number one, dynamic capacity, the ability to move faster. 
And so that's the sense of make sense, curiosity part, sense of urgency, really driving quickly through uh, things and adaptable to change, right? All, all the things sort of make sense if you think about it in this in market, market segment, which is really fast moving, uh, the mobile phone, the chips for mobile phones. And, uh, and the reflection coming out of that uh, work was, you know, that's just not our DNA. You know, we love the size of the market. We like uh, the, to think that uh, we could be really profitable in that space. We've got the uh, technology and the capabilities to to in that market, but it's not our DNA to be moving that quickly. So actually, uh, we are going to take a strategic choice, which is uh, we're going to be uh, in slower evolving market spaces where it fits more neatly with our DNA. So I think the... So, so I use that as an example of uh, strategic choice around these three axioms and uh, to, to the comment before. So I think y you can't be across all of these to the maximum level. You've got to make some choices about that. And that's always going to be strategic. And, uh, and, and what you optimize around has got to be in line with the overall strategy that you're pursuing. Well, that makes sense. That's great. Um, I, I'd probably kind of jump in. I think it's a great question from Andrew, um, Stephen, which, by the way, you see it every day. There are these large mega corporations. Um, you know, he, he gave examples of Apple and Amazon, which have somehow figured out their internal connect with their purpose and what drives them. But there's a broader societal pressure building up on these organizations, mm. uh, which is they're expected to play a certain role while they have, you know, cracked the purpose kind of equation internally, how do they connect with the broader environment, which is expecting them to play a different role? So any, any insights on that? Yeah, so I don't know um, Amazon's purpose, but I've got, um, if you think about, one of the ones that I was in, intrigued by is Uber, right? I don't know what you guys think about Uber. Um, you know, so Uber uh, had a massive uh, crisis, right, in terms of its internal culture, uh, um, and uh, you know, when was that? Twenty seventeen, and um, came to this big collapse uh, of share price and value, and they had to oust the founder and um, and 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 do a lot of soul searching about who they were as an organization. The New CEO who came in and took over, uh, obviously in the midst of this crisis, uh, had uh, Dara. Um, I can't pronounce his surname. Sorry, it's but anyway, Dara's first name, um, Kasi Shoki or something. Um, he uh, he he was really interesting in in one thing he said, which was that uh, they he needed to reconnect the organization back to its a uh, purpose. So kind of, kind of what's that original purpose then? And the original purpose is to find it was making transport affordable and less environmentally impactful. And that's quite interesting. I mean, that's a pretty simple purpose and uh, you can kind of see how it does play into the business model. Now he may have been adopting that statement after the crisis as a way of getting them out of it, but it was a articulation of a pursuit of purpose, which didn't change essentially the business model, but gave them a North star by which they could say, is what we're doing actually in line with that, rather than just pursue, pursuing growth at all costs and all cultural issues they had before. And part of the reflection that came out from that uh, adoption of that purpose, called the statement of that purpose, was they need to be a good citizen, corporate citizen, uh, and partnering with local governments uh, around the world, obviously for licensing issues and so forth. And, uh, and also that they would engage with uh, all various legal disputes that were going on and still going on uh, about treatment of drivers and should they get benefits and so forth. They would engage more productively in that. So um, that's a kind of a long way, uh, I think I'm trying to answer, I don't have the, I don't have the same insight with Amazon's uh, purpose, but uh, that is for me an example of a company which 
was growing at all costs, may, may or may not have had a purpose, but it wasn't very evident before, got into an absolute crisis, had a major, had to majorly think, and it's, and it's way out of um, the problem, is identity was really embracing, anchoring itself on a purpose, and then letting that percolate throughout the organization uh, to change how it was. And uh, I'm not saying that Uber is now like the perfect corporate citizen. I'm sure there are still glitches, but uh, it's, I would argue, and from my experience, uh, say that it's made significant improvements and changes since, uh, since that collapse in 2017. Okay. So the, so I think that's kind of where I'll go. So effectively, I guess what I'm saying on the bigger question is societal um, expectations result in this thing called the social license to operate and that's the where the indirect stakeholders part is really I important and it's much more important now in 4IR than previously I would argue um, so 4IR you need to manage your indirect stakeholders yeah well that's great Stephen this by the way a very uh, good question from Linda I think will resonate with a lot of us which is about most of the purpose work is top down and senior management or leadership decides on it and employees are expected to fall in line. Have you seen any different approach which is more inclusive? Yeah. <laughs> so, so John Lewis, uh, so obviously that's very current and topical in my mind right now. Um, yeah, so, uh, so they actually have this, uh, so they do have a chief purpose officer uh, and, uh, and she is, um, uh, yes, he's in the senior management cadre and has spent a long time in the organization. So there is that element of authority to it. But the distillation to get to that uh, happiness uh, uh, message uh, for all the members uh, was through a complete workforce engagement process. What should they be optimizing around uh, and looking as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a metric for the next 10 years? So, uh, so that was a result of an extremely wide engagement process um there is the i don't think we don't want to mention i mentioned you uh Syng oh, i mentioned you to syngenta so the syngenta one it, it was a senior management team but uh it uh went on for 18 months and had various uh different uh, uh groups that uh, that came together um what i think i think i think you you leadership is is about leading uh, I do think you need to engage uh, broadly to make sure that bef if you, whatever you adopt as a purpose is going to take the organization in the direction you want it to go, which means you've got to have followership from the me members. Um, but it's a, it's a strategic decision. So I don't think it can be abdicated. I don't think you can abdicate responsibility at the leadership level for, for setting the strategy of the company and strategy and purpose need to be combined, as I mentioned before. So I think I would say it's through a, a process of in, engagements required, but ownership still needs to stay with the leadership. Great, thanks. There's um, another question from Milan for you, Steve, which is, what is the best approach to bring together organization and in, individual or people purpose? What is the best way to roll it out? Uh, well, if you've never done it, if you, if you, if you just adopt a purpose, um, so uh, you need a governance team, <laughs> right? And, uh, and that team should have representatives from different levels of hierarchy in different parts of the firm, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, the distillation of that purpose in, into each department area or um, level of thing. Uh, obviously needs to have ownership at that department and that level. So people need to say, given that bigger purpose, this is what we can do to align with the pursuit of that purpose. So it's got to be, uh, it's got to be a set of uh, actions which are uh, put forward at the level at which they're going to be implemented. And, uh, and that's where you get that degree of uh, ownership and buy-in. Uh, it needs to have a process of metrics to it. And again, they should be not only at the macro level, but they should be down at the department or function or however you want to go at level. Uh, and, uh, but with those metrics, there needs to be a degree of accountability. 
and policing. So that's where the, gov the, the, the purpose governance team uh, needs to have responsibility for uh, tracking and reporting on, on progress. Uh, so yeah, so governance team, then it cascades down to all the different parts of the organization. They need to own the ideas of how to implement in their area, then cascades back up into plans uh, where the governance team needs to uh, make sure that they are being pursued and, uh, and then reported on. Uh, and then visibility. So uh, successes uh, need to be celebrated and, uh, and progress moved. And, you, and, and not only because that builds momentum and confidence and everyone's convinced that is the, the, the train has left the station, this is the way we're going, uh, but because the ideas from one part of the organization may have relevance uh, elsewhere as well. So, so celebrating successes and highlighting those is really, really important. Great, thanks, Steve. So I'm kind of rushing a few of the questions. There's some great questions coming up here. And by the way, if we are not able to cover all of those, I'll make sure uh, I follow up with Steve and get back to you. So Linta wants to know, Steve, more about the ambidextrous uh, mindset and okay. leadership you've written about in your book. Sure. Have you read the book? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so ambidextrous. So base, oh, okay, I've got, actually, I think, I, because that's kind of a difficult one, really. So I've got this little page. Um, yeah, you can still see my screen. So what is it's the both and part, right? And and um, okay, how do we start this? So so effectively, uh, if we're going to move forward with difficult issues, we need to bring the two sides or potential outcomes which are in conflict or tension with each other. We've got to bring them together and find a way through that. Um, so. The old model was very much of separating uh, organizationally those issues. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is, well, it's a simple example, right? You've got your core business unit and you've got the new product development part, your R&D center. And, uh, and then products get launched or services get launched or whatever from, from the new business part, uh, new business creation part, not the old part. And the old part is supposed to be generating cash and optimizing and so forth. Well, what we figured out is that the problem with doing that is that uh, that might work in a relatively stable context, but in 4 hour where things are changing really fast, you want all the brains of your company thinking about the new and how to improve, not just the designated few to be thinking about that and whilst everybody else just optimizes and makes their production line more efficient or whatever, or whatever it happens to be. So we want as many people as possible engaged in the tension of making money today with say and still investing in tomorrow and if we separate those kind of things out then uh then we're depriving ourselves of of insight and what it tends to happen then is goes you know that becomes also where budget is allocated is allocated on how much we're putting into new products or new space or whatever it's going to be versus maintaining the core it's an easy place to be, but actually underlying that is this assumption that the two worlds are separate. And in 4AR, we need to be blending those together. So uh, there's a guy called Clayton Christensen, who was a great guy, sadly he died, came up with a book uh, called The Innovate, Innovation Dilemma, Innovator, Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, you can test me, I don't know, let's say end of the 80s, approximately. And, uh, and that was really about, you know, how you can be both doing the old and the new uh, effectively, how you can be uh, innovating uh, whilst being an incumbent in, a, in, a, in an industry. Uh, and, uh, and then the subsequent book they came up with was called The Innovative Solution. And The Innovative Solution was separate, right? Organizationally separate. And uh, the research is very clear that the, the more people, it, the greater proportion of your management cadre was actually required to think across the tension, the more agile you'll be as an organization and, uh, and, and, the, the, and you'll thrive. So, so this is a really important uh, distinction between traditional way of thinking and organizing and managing and today. Now, the question is, how can you do that, right? How can you get people to be, well, one thing is, is, is tension is, you know, in the matrix structures, uh, we can have a lot of fighting. I guess you guys are familiar with this. You can get like gridlock in a matrix, right? 
but actually the point of which the matrix comes together, you know, where you've got those overlapping lines of whatever of geographies and products or whatever it happens to be, uh, where those tension points are and where everybody starts fighting. Uh, if you make someone or the individuals responsible for the both rather than the product line or the country line or where it happens to be, um, so they're actually responsible for both, then it's the both and, and they've got to just optimize within that. So that's kind of the thinking we want to get to. And, uh, and so matrix structures could get you there, but unfortunately the way most people have set up their matrix structures actually leads, can lead to blockage, uh, gridlock. So we have this uh, little diagram here. So uh, level one thinking, if you like, is either or, all right, I'm going to be optimizing, I don't know, let's do this. Um, uh, you can do service, uh, customer service or product, uh, efficiency or, or maybe, uh, as I said, it's going to be new products versus, uh, well, I'm spend money on new products versus core products, whatever, either or. How do we allocate? So that's the most simple basic thinking and it's not sufficient. And then the second one is, well, it's all about trade-off. So we're going to give some of new product investment and some of maintain the core. Probably I'm going to under, under invest in both, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to spread it carefully. I don't have enough money to spend on everything. So I'm going to do a compromise trade-off, right? And then uh, we've got creative thinking. This is kind of where most traditional management books went to, uh, certainly uh, last century's books, um, not to name any, but, uh, and that's really sort of what we say, oh, be, you know, how can we expand the range of possibilities, possible solutions? It's still the X, Y choice that we're looking at, but it's now, how can we be really more creative about kind of where we fit? And there's a bit of a, the tension and so forth, but you know, we, we think about that. In, in 4IR, what the way through that is, what are the constraints that we can actually just release? What are the embedded assumptions about how we operate? What is our point of view about, as I say, capital, right? Every project's got to hit an M, uh, whatever, IRR, or uh, in order to get through some hurdle rate before it gets uh, accepted by the division or whatever we're working for. Well, why? Why is it going to IRR? I mean, let's take away that constraint. How about we don't think about capital as being the principal measure of whether a project go ahead or not? And so in uh, in 4 ir with this integrated thinking or both and thinking is, you know, let's move away from perhaps um, the X, Y trade-off. Let's look at some of the constraints and how we can, can drop that. So. Um, so there's this ambidexterity is the both and, there are different styles of thinking about that. And then one of the tools that I really like is, um, this is from Chris Ardress years ago, um, but Chris Ardress's thing, which is, um, you know, basically don't, I mean, you, you wanna get to, ev through every conflict and point of tension should be an opportunity for learning effectively. So you inquire first about why people think the spending should be on new products versus old products, or whatever. what are the perspectives that they've got? You just inquire and then you acknowledge um, by obviously that's the combination with uh, with your perspectives or your goals and objectives, as well as other people, what the other people's are, you acknowledge that. And then you're advocating. There is still the advocacy part, but first there's an inqu inquiry part. And, and so what we're finding is that that's that sort of tools are really helpful. So that's the, the, the working together part. And, and I, I put into there that I think that would fit into I, I, work, you know, leadership with humanity as well, because you've got to first have this point of view that you don't know all the answers. So you want to inquire. You're inquiring in a way to actually learn rather than, um, uh, rather than just to undermine their argument. And, and the uh, and, and uh management requires this both and thinking, which is gonna oftentimes require challenging um, constraints to just be able to think in different new ways. Awesome, Steve, thanks a lot. I know we are at time and it's been an amazing conversation. Great questions. As I said, we have some very good questions still in the dialogue box. I'll separately follow up with you, Steve, and uh, make sure that the, the participants um, get the responses from you. Sure. Uh, I will be also buy my book too. Buy the book. Buy the book. <laughs> yeah, we can buy your book too. And we have these slides, which uh, I'll share with you. So you get, uh, basically will have the materials we used. Um, I, I want to thank everybody again uh, for joining this conversation. I think um, you said, Steve, the leaders need to be the role models. I think by showing our commitment to the change we want to drive and change we want to see, uh, is the first step towards really making a difference. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So I so appreciate the time. It, it's been a great conversation. Steve, thanks a lot again for joining and leading this dialogue. And a big thanks to Kanan for pulling this together. And I hope to see you soon in another conversation. So thanks a lot and a pleasure seeing you. Thank you, All Steve. Time. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great session. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Wonderful session. Thank bye-bye. you. Bye. Great session. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Very thought provoking, Steve. I, it's wonderful. You know, yes. looking at these slides, very simple stuff. You know, these these small things are what makes the difference and brings that humanity factor to the forefront. Thank you. Uh, guys, I mean, honestly, thank you for the opportunity to share. I was going to say, I mean, can I, am I allowed to participate as a participant in the future? Absolutely. It'll be our privilege to have you, Steve. <laughs> I have you on my list now, so you will get all these invites. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. So I'll send you the slides. Uh, is that, that, we'll do that, right? You can email those to me, Steve. I'll yeah. share them. Uh, participants. Great. All right. Thanks. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, James. Great to see you. Thanks, Clarice. Thanks, Kathy.